mentioned, we're, Mike Cassidy, we're very happy to have you. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you for coming from what I guess we can call a recruitment event. Uh, we're delighted, of course, that you applied to our program and we're very pleased to have admitted you and now we hope you'll join us. So we'll spend a few minutes today maybe trying to offer some additional information to help you make up your mind and make sure that Berkeley is the right place for you in the coming year. Uh, we've got a few slides Professor De La Manac and I have prepared. Maybe we'll go through those, but those will only take a few minutes. And while we're presenting or after we're presenting, if anybody has any questions, we kind of, we very much hope you'll, you'll go ahead and ask. Mm -hmm. So I'll start by saying a few words about the transportation engineering program. But for those of you who are in systems, although the systems program might differ a little bit in the detail, the kind of the general philosophy and the expectations and so forth, they're very similar. So I think what both I and Professor De La Manoc have to say today will be relevant to the entire group. Okay, at least that's our hope. So let me see if I can find, where do I see the shared screen? There it is. Let me see if I can find, yeah. Can you guys see these uh, these slides I've prepared here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So as I said, I'm gonna start and just say a few words about the transportation engineering program within our civil engineering MEng program. Uh, I wanna start talking, say a few words about the course requirements. And the reason for that is because what our respective programs are all about and the things that we try to emphasize because we think they're important, those are reflected in what we're going to expect of you and what we're going to ask you to participate in in the coming year in terms of the curriculum. Now, part of a big part of this curriculum, by no means the only part of this curriculum, but a big part are the capstone design projects. And that, of course, is where each of you would work with the faculty advisor, in some cases alone with the advisor, but more often than not, I think, with a small team of students and the advisor. And you'll be working on a kind of a design project or the development of a prototype of some technology-based item. In the case of transportation, of course, you'll be trying to develop an idea for the transportation sector. It'll be the kind of thing that addresses a real problem in transportation or in systems and the other, as the case may be, and one for which there is a real market for your solutions. Yeah. So what, what typically involves here is either the development or the application of technology in some scientifically sound way. And what I'll do as part of my formal presentation is I'll offer you an illustrative example of a capstone project from the transportation engineering group that's actually going on today, just to give you a flavor of what this will entail. And then uh, very briefly, I'll just give an, a kind of a rough timeline of how your studies and your capstone project will proceed over the coming academic year. So with that said, I'll take a look at this uh, little outline we have, this little outline we have here with the course requirements and where you'll notice the capstone design project is embedded in the curriculum. But as I said before, it's not the only, the project is not the only part of the curriculum. It's worth noting from this top bullet that you would be expected to pursue 24 units in the two semesters. And I should mention that these 24 units is precisely the same unit requirements we have for our Master of Science in Civil Engineering here at Berkeley. But they're not all, and some of the courses are the same, but they're not all identically the same. So for example, in the MEng program, you would take six one-unit courses involving core leadership. Now, from the what we have here are 13 one-unit courses, a menu of 13 courses from which you could choose. And as the name implies, this is all about leadership. So to give you an idea of the kind of classes in this list of 13, there's a class, for example, on project management and team dynamics. There's a course on research and development of technology management and ethics. There's a course on entrepreneurship for engineers. There's one on promoting diversity. Another course involved with, with the power of persuasion. 
another one on industry analysis, yet another on finance. Really, the list goes on and on. And as I said, from this list of 13, you would be required to pick the six courses that you find most interesting and perhaps most relevant for your career goals and your interests. Yeah. Uh, then you'll notice in the bullet below, the capstone project is integrated as part of your studies. You'll pursue the capstone design in both the fall and spring semesters of the academic year. Then below that, you'll notice if you happen to be in the transportation engineering program, there's a certain set of select courses, select graduate courses that all our MS, all our master students and all our PhD students take. And these are, these are courses that we call core courses because we think they're fundamentally important. The first of these that you would take is CE 251. It's titled Transportation Operations. And what that course is concerned with is the physics of how transport systems actually operate and how you can interject interventions that are effective, that do the kind of things you want to have done. The other course is CE 252 and transportation systems analysis. It simply recognizes that components of a transportation system, like street links and intersections, do not operate in isolation from other transport systems, like public transit systems. So how do cars and buses coexist? And how does transit and airports, how do they interact? I mean, transport systems are large scale macro level things. And how does one go about evaluating and, uh, and, uh, and managing these big things, these big entities? Uh, the reason we want all our MN students to take these two courses is, is it's especially important, I think, in your case, because of the emphasis that the MN program has on technology. There's certainly no question that, as you see in this lower paragraph in the, uh, in the slide I'm showing here, the, the wealth of technology that exists for transportation surveillance and communication and for computing, they definitely offer tremendous opportunities to improve transport systems. But it's also true, and sometimes, unfortunately, far too often what happens is that technology is applied or developed for a system and it doesn't make the system better. In some cases, it makes the system worse. Now, I want to give you a very simple example of how this happens, an example of a transport technology that you're all probably familiar with because it's been around for decades. I'm talking about the example of freeway on-ramp metering, where you put traffic signals at on-ramps to a freeway in an effort to reduce the time spent or the delay over the entire system, where here the entire system is the freeway and the collection of on-ramps that are metered. Now, although this, these kind of technologies have been in operation all over the world for many decades, in many cases, they don't actually achieve what they set out to do. And the reason for that is because a misunderstanding of the physics of what's involved in this particular system. Far too often, I talk to people who are involved in developing and installing metering systems, and they tell me that the objective behind their work is to increase the travel speeds on what would otherwise be congested freeways. And that may sound like a good objective, but it actually, it's not a very good one at all. In fact, it can be very counterproductive. And to understand why the objective of in trying to increase freeway speeds by metering is a bad example, we'll just take a look at an extreme case where you metered the on-ramps so restrictively that you transferred congestion from the freeway mainline to the many metered on-ramps but you metered it so restrictively that you only allowed a few vehicles on at the freeway at any one time. You only allowed a few vehicles to enter the freeway at any one time. If you think about that, that would certainly maximize speeds on the freeway. You'd have only a few cars on the freeway and they might be doing 75 miles per hour, which would be great once they get on the freeway. But the delay you transferred from the freeway to the on-ramps far surpasses any savings you now achieve on the freeway. And this happens simply because this can happen, although maybe less dramatically, it does happen <coughs> where ramp metering, <coughs> excuse me, serves to over control <coughs> such that the collective delay on the on-ramps exceeds the delay that's saved on the freeway. 
So the question might be, well, what would be the proper objective for metering freeways? <laughs> and one of the things you would learn in CE 251 very early in the semester is that the first law of system theory, theory says that all else equal, you can reduce the time that objects spend in a system. In other words, you might re reduce the time that vehicles spend in a freeway system by increasing the rate that these vehicles exit the system. So what happens with a congested freeway is that the congestion spills over and blocks freeway off ramps. And once that congestion blocks the off ramps, it starves the off ramps of flow. So if you were to design a metering system that tried to prevent these queues, these congested queues on the freeway from blocking the on ramps and you increase the off ramp flows as a result, then you'd be doing something good. You really would be reducing the time and the delay collectively spent in the system. But in order to know that you do that, that's what you'd have to try to do. And that's what you'd want to measure before and after to claim whether or not you've been successful. So anyway, this is a very long winded kind of way of describing why it is important, we think, to take these core courses in the MEng program so that when you are developing and applying technology, you only do good things and you don't do on or you, we minimize the likelihood that there's going to be any negative unintended consequences. In any case, if you're in the transportation engineering program, we'd also like you to take a few technical electives and you can choose from a menu of courses that include highway traffic operations which my colleague, Professor De La Manocchi teaches, or you could take a course in public transportation systems, which I teach, or you could take a class in air transportation. So you see, we'd like you to take at least one course from one of these three areas so that you have a real strong working knowledge of one primary major travel mode. And you could also take from this menu a course in behavioral modeling. Say, for example, you'd like to know how technology might influence human behavior. Well, there's a course there that you might want to take then. Uh, we'd want you to choose two from this menu of four. And there'd be all kinds of additional coursework as well, including an integrated, including the, the performance of your capstone project. And there'd be a complementary one unit course each semester where you would engage in independent study to understand the theory and the state of the practice in the area that's relevant to your project. And finally, we'd have you take a course E295, which is to sharpen your communication skills. So these are the courses we'd ask you to take. What I'd like to talk about now, what I'd like to offer now is one example of a capstone project in the transportation area that is currently ongoing. And to appreciate what this what this problem entails, imagine you're a you're a driver for a delivery truck and you want to take your truck into a busy downtown area where you might want to park at several places of business to unload whatever goods you're delivering. And of course, in congested, dense downtown areas in the middle of the day, curbside parking is very scarce. So delivery drivers have a great deal of time, a great deal of trouble finding available curbsides where they could park, get out of the way of traffic and unload their goods. So what invariably happens far too often is that delivery trucks will double park. And this is extremely counterproductive because by double parking in a busy downtown area, you create a bottleneck, a bottleneck that causes congestion and even safety problems. So the city is not happy with this and drivers are not happy with this double parking. Moreover, the delivery companies are not happy with this double parking because they very often receive tickets, they get citations for blocking traffic. In fact, I'll show you in a minute that the kind of money that delivery companies have to pay each year in double parking fines is really extraordinarily high. And then of course, the merchants, the businesses are not happy about this because then the extra cost from tickets that the delivery companies incur, they pass on to their customers, the businesses, and then the businesses pass this cost on to their, to their customers, the public. So you'll notice we have a real problem here, one that deals with transportation and one where there's going to be a market for solutions. And the proposed solution in this case is to build intelligence into curbside space and to transmit that intelligence to truck drivers or to dispatching personnel in delivery companies 
not only to inform drivers of where empty curb space might be, but to allow drivers in an efficient way to reserve curb space at the time they're going to be at that business and wanting to unload their products. And, and not only that, but eventually to help guide them in their tour as they go through a downtown area, stopping at various companies to unload their product, to try to design that tour, that truck routing strategy based on the availability of parking. So that's basically the plan. Here in this next slide, we kind of repeat what I just mentioned. But what I'd like to call your attention to is the bottom bullets that shows the tremendous amount of money that delivery companies pay because of parking violations. So for example, in one recent year, in just the city of New York, UPS alone paid $23 million in double parking fines. And FedEx paid about 10 million. So this, I think these delivery companies don't just see these fines as the cost of doing business. I think they would very much like to have means by which they could reduce their need to double park and thereby reduce their parking fines. And I'm sure all other stakeholders, including the city, would like that to happen as well because they'll have smoother and less congested traffic in the downtown areas due to deliveries. So here's kind of the idea of how this thing works. As we say, we build intelligence into the curb. We convey that intelligence to the truck driver through maybe a phone app. Ultimately, the goal is not just to tell the truck driver when and where available curb space is, but again, to allow the truck driver to reserve space effectively and to plan his or her trip based on uh, available curb space. You know, there's a, there's a kind of a, maybe you've heard of it, there's a problem called the vehicle routing problem, also known as the traveling salesman problem, which is a, turns out to be a tremendously complex problem to solve to try to route a truck in the most efficient way to serve all its deliveries. It, it turns out you need heuristics, kind of trial and error approximations to solve the problem. But ultimately, the idea is to build in curb space parking as a constraint in trying to give to trying to guide the delivery driver into pursuing his or her route. Okay, so that's that's this is the second year over which this project is occurring. It'll probably continue for a third year with a different group of students as well to finalize this project because it's a big one and it's not going to be a stat. It's not going to be finished in just a single year, but over several years, students have had a chance to work on this and make real progress. Now, you might wonder, how is it possible to get all this work done in just uh, a short amount of time? Now, there it is. Well, here's a timeline for the capstone design project. If you decide to join us, then in July, you'll be given information as to what the available projects are for you to work on, and you'd pick one that is of most interest. You do that in August. In September, you'd form your team. That is, you'd get to know your faculty advisor. You'd get to know the industry advisor who's also working on this project. And you'd get to know any other team members. And you'd start in the fall semester working together and making progress on your project. In the start of the spring semester, you give a project report, a status report to everyone involved. And you continue the work then in the spring, wrapping it up before the end of the semester. So this is what I had to share. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, maybe we can take a moment to see if you wanted to ask anything about what I was talking about. If not, I guess then I'll turn the floor over to Professor De La Manake to talk about the systems program. Sure. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Great, so very happy to be here with you. So as Professor Cassidy says, I am a faculty both in the system and transportation program, and today I'm wearing my system hat. So I'm gonna talk to you about uh, uh, the system um, the system program and uh, what, uh, what we do here. So, uh, 
So just to start, so the, this is uh, the group of faculty currently that is that belongs to the system uh, program. As you see, we have range of faculty that covers range also of of topics and methods. So what makes system peculiar among, among the civil and environmental engineering programs is that it's a uh, is a program mostly focused on methods and there's a broad range of application. So we have a professor, for example, myself and Professor Bayan work a lot on transportation. Professor Gonzalez works, works also on transportation with a focus more on uh, city networks. Professor Scott Mora is the faculty lead of PATH, which is the partner for advanced transportation technology and works mainly in energy system and uh, uh, smart grid. Uh, Professor Sengupta and Professor Hansen both work on aviation system. Professor Soga works on hazard and uh, resilience of cities. Professor Worker works on behavioral models for transportation, Professor Zeckel works in geosystem. So as you can see, we have a very broad range of application. And so it's a program that focus mostly on trying and uh, get uh, methods so that we can apply in any of the application that we work on. So this is something that I usually amuse myself to do with the students of system. So what do you think is for you as system engineering? Can you Tell me, like you can just scan the QR code and give me your answer. So it's completely anonymous. So we, we don't know who answered what. Let's see. What do you think? Here is the QR code. Let's see. Oh, we have someone that just entered. Do you have any idea what is for you system engineering? I can tell you what students before you have answered. And so we have a very broad range of keywords, as you can see. So we have, we go from Method-based, which is what I told at the beginning, but also optimization, data, uh, transportation models, infrastructure, intelligent transportation, so a large-scale system. So that is to say that what we do in civil and environmental engineering system is a very broad, uh, uh, it, it includes very broad topics. So it focuses mainly on several areas. So mostly built environment for resilience of uh, infrastructure and, uh, and uh, networks. We have an area on social system that focus on the behavioral of uh, humans and then also natural system with geotechnical, uh, with geotechnical research and also, uh, and also other those research. And all of this cover is covered with a large, uh, sets of methods, they range from optimization control, but also to machine learning, network science, behavioral experiment, and physical models. Both of those interconnected together creates what for us is systems. So I, um, so Professor Cassidy gave a, uh, an overview of what is, uh, what are the main, um, the main requirements for uh, the Master of Engineering and for what concerns the uh, requirements in terms of uh, uh, leadership uh, um, classes and in terms of the more uh, leadership and business oriented classes, system and transportation is basically the same requirement. What is mostly different is the type of uh, requirements that we uh, ask for system students in terms of specific related to system classes. So usually since system is a very broad class, uh, broad uh, uh, program, we do not have specific core classes as it is in transportation, but we have a, a menu of them. And we request that each of the students 
pick and choose four among this uh, menu of classes based on your expectation of, uh, of the program, based also on your interests. And so the important thing is that you choose four of those. And as you can see, in order to cover all the application that we have and all the methods that we have, all this, um, um, this um, menu basically covers classes that go from transportation. So you have CE262 and the CE264 that are both transportation oriented classes. So one is taken in the fall, the other one is taken at the spring. And as you can see, they are a bit overlapping with the transportation. But then we have also other uh, type of classes that instead cover other types of uh, uh, applications. So we have 263, which is scalable spatial analysis that covers basically all that is network science and application to smart cities. We have uh, um, the 290 classes, 290i and the 290 uh, uh, which is data-driven control method for civil system and data science in aviation that are mostly focused on control with data science. And uh, uh, while one is specific to all the civil system, we have the other two that are focused mo mo mostly on aviation. And then we have classes instead that focus mainly on numerical methods. So for example, you have finite element methods that teaches you how to simulate any type of structure that you want. We have methods uh, for environmental flow modeling. We have methods that cover data science for energy. So we do not expect uh, you to follow all these classes. We expect you to build a, a reasonable plan of those with your faculty advisor. You'll, you'll have to pick for our students mostly pick two in the fall, two in the spring, but again, this is vastly, um, is not um, a specific requirement, so it can vastly vary among the uh, different students. So what you'll have to do in general, and I'll quite go fast on this since Professor Cassidy already uh, talked at length about this, so ideally, so what you'll have to do is complete 24 course units. So that means in general, all our course units are, all our courses are three units. So that means basically around eight courses um, of which 12 must be uh, CE courses. And we require that 12, so four of uh, those courses come from the list I just showed you of uh, the core system classes. Since you are uh, Master of Engineering students, you'll have additional requirements that include you, uh, leadership classes. Those again overlaps with the transportation one. And then we have uh, uh, units of capstone project. So as for the transportation, also the system uh, program has a capstone project that uh, revolves around an application of uh, um, system engineering to um, uh, uh, an industry case. So um, just to give you an idea of how broad it is our um, program and what you can do after with what uh, you study here at Berkeley. So I've compiled a list of ex-alumni and what they currently do. And uh, as you can see, we have students that <clears throat> currently are working at Tesla and students that currently working on students, ex-alumni. So alumni uh, that are work excellent. So that are working now in Amazon Robotics. We have CEOs that have funded their own company, both for example, in engineering or in robotics. And then uh, now those um, startups company have been, for example, acquired by uh, Sirius. And then we have other students that instead went and work for data science or for uh, software engineering, um, position at Google, at Instagram, uh, at Siemens. And lastly, we have also students that have worked on, that have continued their career in academia. And so now we have a, a large a group of alumni that has been, that has currently professor in other universities that goes from Cornell, Michigan, Purdue, Vanderbilt, and uh, Georgia Tech and MIT. I also want to tell you what, mostly they are doing our students after so i put this both for system and transportation um so most of our systems students after the graduation go on to work in the private sector and a few of them do the phd 
while for transportation, we have also a big chunk of students that go on to work on the public sector. And this is uh, clearly like, a, um, as this is clearly uh, like all the um, transportation authorities and the transportation DOTs are, are, are a good uh, source of work for our uh, transportation students. Um, so, this is mostly what I wanted to tell you. So I we look forward to having you in Berkeley and let us me know or let us know if you have any question concerning both transportation and system program, we'll be happy to answer them. Okay. So uh, everybody out there, this is a chance for you guys to ask us questions. There must be some things lingering on your mind about our respective programs, maybe uh, maybe we could help answer those now, but you'll have to let us know what those questions are. You refer to unmute. May I have a, oh, sorry. Yeah. Please do. Ah, uh, I'm Rome Kitamura, may I have a quick question? Yes, please. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited and uh, thank you for this uh, big uh, opportunity for us. And I have a question about the uh, elective module. Uh, Nishika, uh, thank you uh, for kindly uh, responding to my question about uh, elective module, so like intelligent transportation system. I think uh, elect, uh, intelligent transportation system, last year, uh, the MNG uh, student can uh, select uh, as an elective module. But uh, this year, uh, of course, as uh, she said, uh, if uh, academic supporter uh, ap approved, uh, we can choose uh, intelligent transportation system. But uh, why uh, disappear uh, elective module uh, intelligent, intelligent transportation system of, from this year? Yeah, it, it disappeared. We simply don't have an instructor for that course for the coming year. Now that may seem like a gaping hole, but it really isn't. If you wanted, if you if you took, for example, Maria Laura's class in 255, you would learn about technology application. When you take CE 251, you will learn about how to apply technology to do the most good. So the fact that we don't offer this coming year a course explicitly involved in ITS application, we have all the fundamentals you'll need to know on how to apply those technologies to do good. And you'll have, of course, the business end of the courses as you would anyway about the entrepreneurial opportunities with regard to that technology and how to communicate that to the public and and, uh, and markets and so forth. So that's really the answer. We just don't have an instructor. It It's not, we don't see that as a great loss. We've covered, we'll cover mm -hmm. the material quite, quite effectively with the courses we do have. Oh, I see, yeah, thank you. Thank but you. uh yeah thank you so but uh without uh intelligent transportation system uh i was wondering i can learn uh intelligent transportation system yeah 251 you'll learn it 255 you can learn it oh. 259 you ah. can it'll be a part of all these courses uh, oh, okay yeah thank course, you it'll be part of every course you take in transportation either directly uh, yes. or indirectly you know, ah, yeah. more importantly That's than learning about, say, what's the, let me return to the ramp metering example, because I think that's something that everyone is familiar with. Rather than learning about maybe the newest innovation in ramp metering, it's more important to learn about the fundamentals of what you want to achieve by ramp metering. And then you can develop the system to achieve those specific objectives. Does that make oh, sense? Yeah, so we'll that give, makes sense. Yeah, thank you. We'll plenty of that. We'll give you plenty of that. Okay, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, Good. we're looking Thank forward you. to having you. That Hi, was a Professor very good Professor. question, a very astute one. Yes, Leng Feng, go ahead. I'm 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 really curious. I'm really, really want to know how can they pursue their education? I mean, I mean, I see someone else who pursues their PhD degree after I'm after this program. And we all know this program is a terminal degree. How can they continue their education? As a matter of fact, it was initially established as a terminal degree. That is no longer the case. We do have, 
I think I think the statistics that Professor De La Mock was presenting to you were across all master's degrees, the percentage who go on to PhDs. But these days, some percentage of those students are MN students. Some MN students want to pursue the PhD and they're welcome to do that. Probably not as many MN students want to do it as MS students, but that's just the nature of uh, what MN students are interested in. Most are interested in getting into industry and being entrepreneurial and making a difference through technology and innovative ideas. But for those who decide they'd like to stay and pursue that through a PhD, there it's possible to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. How about another hey one? Guys. Yeah, yeah. I have a question about the, the capstone project. Right. So are we only allowed to pick from our own department or can no. we pick the no. no? I should have made that clear. Anyone, so for example, the, the, the illustrative example that I went over is not just a manned by transportation engineering MN students. This is MN students from across the college, from across the Fung Institute. So okay. you, could, you could take a systems capstone design or you could take something in electrical engineering or IEOR, industrial engineering, whatever project interests you most and you think would uh, propel you in your career best. Okay, perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then I just had another question about the courses. So yes. I already asked this question in chat and Jessica kind of told me some information, but it's 12 units per semester. That's correct. And Roughly half those... of those, if you're, you're in, you yourself mentioned you're in the transportation engineering program. So about half those units would be transportation engineering courses, the same mm -hmm. courses that all our graduate students take. And approximately the other half would be with the business school as part of the Fung Institute, the entrepreneurial classes, business related classes and so forth. And the capstone design counts for several units as well. Oh, OK. So, oh, OK. So but about 12 of those units would be transportation engineering courses in your case. Right. But then the business courses are one unit each. So I would uh, need... they tend to be small units. Yeah, they're they're seminar type. So they're kind of show okay. up for class, interact. I don't know how much homework they have and so forth, but uh, you will have, in addition to the homework you'll have from the regular core courses in this, in your case, transportation, there's an awful lot of work to do on the core project. Right, okay. So, yeah. oh, it's, so, so does a unit mean like the more units per course, the more work that course requires? That That's what it's supposed to mean. And I, I hopefully that's what it means, yeah. Right, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Those are good questions, everyone. How about another one? Uh, may I, can yes. I have a question? You can have as many as you like. Oh, thank you. Uh, should we prepare for something uh, before uh, enrolling the uh, class of uh, transportation engineering? Should we prepare for something like uh, uh, Python? or some physics, uh, mathematics? Yes, I mean, yes and no. Uh, if the systems courses and some of the transportation courses, for example, have a lot of Python coding. So if you don't, if you're not brushed up on that, this might you might take the summer to learn a few things. Certainly in systems and in transportation, physics you mentioned is very important, but we presume you've taken that courses as an undergrad. So while it's all well and good to brush up and prepare for the year ahead, uh, I also find in my personal experience, it's nice to get a good rest, have a good restful summer. So you can hit the ground in August, you hit the ground running. So you're gonna wanna kind of balance that. That would oh, be my, yeah. that would be my okay. fatherly like advice, I think. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. How about another? These are all good questions. Hi, uh, yeah, I got a question um, about the core systems uh, specialization. There, there are some core courses. Um, are you only allowed to to choose from them, or is it possible to choose from other other, other specialization? So the core courses should be four of those in that list. Then outside. Yeah, of those, you you are free to choose an SC system in addition to those in the core list. Okay. Yeah. So the four technical electives are 
uh, mandatory to be from that list? Yes, the, the, the okay. core courses should be from that list, yes. And it's uh, possible, I, I presume it's possible to see online the description uh, of these courses more, yes. like, the more elaborately. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yes, I think it's, I can find you the link and put it in the chat. No, no, I'm sure it's I, very clear. I already okay. sent him the link, but I can send it to everybody. Uh, let me... But if I could chime in here, Maximilian, it's certainly true you can get very nice course descriptions of each course. But when you start each semester in the fall and then again in the spring, it's good to shop around. You don't have to commit yourself to any one set of courses when you're trying to choose between several. It's good for a week or two to sit in to see which each course is going to, to get a better idea of what each course is going to entail. And then you can make a more informed decision about the courses you want to take for the coming semester. That's just kind of good general advice is shop around by sitting in the course for a week or so by oversubscribing to the number of courses you're going to take and then drop after you had a better sense of what each course entails. Yes, yes, I will do that. Thank you. One more? Two more? Well, okay. It was certainly very nice uh, chatting with you this afternoon or this morning. Um, as I say, we were delighted to admit you, and we very much hope you decide to join us in the coming year. I'm sure I speak for my colleague, Maria Laura, in saying if between now and April 15th, you have any questions or thoughts you want to share, just drop one of us an email and we'll get back to you. We can even set up Zoom meetings if that's necessary. So as you're making your decision, kind of keep us in the loop if there's anything we can do to help. Okay. Any last minute questions or thoughts? All right, then I guess we'll call this meeting an end. Again, thank you very much. Hope to thank see you in the fall. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, thank thank you so you. much. Bye bye.